Again, same Harish is having a HbA1c of 9 with LDL cholesterol 170 mg per DL, HDL 30, total cholesterol 280, fibrous fat 300 mg. Doctor has prescribed lifestyle medication, uh, modification, and medical nutrition therapy, DPP4 inhibitors, rosebud statin, glass aspirin. Now, doctor, the patient says, yeah, these medicines are very expensive, I cannot take it. So, will you compromise on the medication or uh, what will you say? Again, practical situation. We do come across such situations. You want to give best of the best medication, right? Because you don't want any hypoglycemia in your patient. That's why sulfonylureas are slowly and steadily they are going out of the market. You want to give best of the best medication, best DPP for inhibitors, though you've got choice of so many DPP for inhibitors nowadays. But then they are expensive. They are costing 40, 45 rupees per tablet. So, I mean, how is it? We should explain the advantages of this to this medicine. Okay. Uh, side uh, drawbacks of cheaper medicine. Sure, sure. So again, it boils down to yeah. It, 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 this is this. Want to just tell him like bluntly on his face that अच्छा अभी नहीं लेना है. I would explain the math. This is what the medication cost is. I understand. If you do not, and it might just get really progressive if not taking care, you might end up into a hospital. That is, imagine उसका bill कितना होएगा. तो आप देख लो आप math अपना खुद का देख लो. So this is also this is also a good way of. Explain Shared. that because then you tell the consequences of the complication okay. cost. It's not treatment. This is treatment cost. Yeah. You then are telling the complication cost, which are going to be much more higher. So that's another which approach which, which you can approach it. Yes, you are absolutely right. So these are some of the approaches which you have to undertake in these type of situations. And we even need to explain ki which medicine is given for what. So then they will come to me. I sure. think you could break it down to the logic behind the requirement for all the four medications plus the lifestyle uh, thing. So once they are able to understand better, they will know that it is the right. You know what? You are absolutely right. Not that doctors, they don't want to do that. Every doctor, I mean, based on what uh, 36 years I have been interacting with them, everyone wants to do that. In this present scenario, it is extremely difficult to explain because time constraint is one big factor. So that is why you will notice that there are some other paraphernalia, there are other support staff, they are doing this, right? Why is it so counsellors, dietitians, or all are coming? Not that doctors, they cannot counsel, they can also counsel and the patient will be very happy to get the counselling from a doctor as compared to any other counsellor. Yes. But then it's only because whatever I have got in my mind, I am able to explain in front of you and most of my, you know, uh, cowbells, what I have got in my mind, they are clear before I move to it all. So that is the biggest advantage. Last uh, case. And to reinforce, uh, it's not that you will require this lifetime. If you will change your lifestyle, you will do good diet, you will lose your weight, you will do by non stop. Sir, medical nutrition therapy by itself can reduce HB1C Absolutely. by 1%. 1%, percent, percent, right? But how many of us do that? I mean, one person can reduce 37 percent all these microvascular complications. All that we know, you know. We also tell to the patients, I know that I can reduce 37 percent my microvascular complications if I reduce my HbA1c from 9 to 8. But yes, still, right. how many, how many are able to adhere to that? So again, it boils down to consequences. Once I know the consequences, whether I like it or not, yeah, I'll be right. tempted to do that. Now the third one, this is the last one. Lata is a young girl, four years old. Complaining of losing weight, frequent menstruation, excessive hunger and tiredness. She comes to a diabetologist with a father and upon investigation is found to be suffering from type 1 diabetes. Shock. Now how you are going to explain this to a father? We talked about the empathetic attitude. Most important. Huh? How you are going to convey that? Actually, this was the case uh, I discussed with Dr. Neeta Deshpande. I said, Dr. Sir, how do you do that? Because when I think as a father, that a young girl, you know, three years old, four years old, gets detected type 1 diabetes, I mean, I'll be shattered. So I think it's all into a skill. So I had an experience just in this month only, a few weeks back, where a six year old girl was uh, diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So the parents came with a lot of questions in a notebook. Okay, and the majority of the questions were can she play with her sister? Can she eat food in school? Uh, can she sleep on the same bed? So for them, it's something that they are not aware. What is it? Is it communicable, non-communicable? It's lifelong. So it's all with uh, starting at base, at scratch level, telling them that it's going to be okay. It's a lifelong thing. 
you need not make that kid feel like something is wrong with her. She is just as good as everybody else. She is just as okay as everybody else. Only thing is you have to match her food with the amount of insulin that she needs to take and that we can do with educating you over a period of time. So I think that first, first uh, few days that you have is very important to have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with the uh, parents so that they also understand. Because unknowingly they might also do harm uh, for so, the So again, it boils down to the empathetic attitude. You have got to be empathetic and we will touch upon that later. Now, I want to, due to a little bit uh, you know, positive time, I will again request you to now go to the next level. What are the solutions you suggest? So, you know, think about again, you had, uh, you were uh, from the patient side. Patient side. So, okay, you suggest now, as a patient, what are the remedial measures you will suggest to have a good relationship? You think from doctor, or shall I do the role reversal? No, no. Same, continue that. Fine. So your thought processes are quite in place in that. Can I request just a like suggestion? I do not know. So I mean, we can save the five ten minutes and we can hear you directly. Okay. So I would fine. love the suggestions because so, okay, we fine. all. So this is. We can just talk, no? so yeah. We all can talk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have done this exercise, and uh, you know the points which came about, uh, you know, to rebuild doctor patient relationship was by and large, you know, building trust. Right. Trust building came up as the first point where we felt that most of the issues are there because of the trust deficit. Enhancing competencies. I mean, many times when we miss out those small, small things sometimes, you know, uh, maybe that can uh, avoid this type of situation. Systems to provide more time to patients. Now, one thing is also coming out that we all want to devote time, but we don't have paraphernalia. So maybe it will be a good idea if there are some junior doctors, for instance. I mean, those who can spend time with the patients. Because as a patient, what do I want? I want somebody should hear me out. Oh. Right? So if there are some systems, what dietitians are doing? So diet related, all the issues dietitians are telling. There are issues related to psychologists, uh, other lifestyle, some counselors are telling. So by view of which, I am trying to reduce the time which patients want to spend inside the doctor's channel. Listening skills. I mean, how many of you feel you are excellent listeners? How many of you feel? Very good listeners. Huh? I can do one test. Love Have you heard whisper? Okay. Uh, Chinese whisper? Yeah. Chinese whisper? Shall I do that? I can tell you Chinese whisper I have done n number of times. And I find out that though we claim, but unfortunately that uh, f fun exercise tells me that we are not. Right, so again, I may not do that because uh, time is less. Otherwise, I would have done this. You know, if it was a three hours workshop, I would have done this. You know, because it's a very interesting, uh, you know, exercise. But it tells that listening-wise, we are not able. Unfortunately, we miss out small, small things because we are not very good listeners. Empathetic attitude. You know, I will share with you LIR, I will explain to you what do I mean when I say empathetic attitude, which also came about very important. But it's communication skills. You know, communication skills are also equally important when we are dealing with patients. Satisfying patients' queries, enhancing soft skills. I mean, these are some of the points which came. And of course, how to communicate the bad news. I mean, very important. I mean, if you do not communicate bad news, then, you know, when that problem occurs, as you very rightly said, the patient blames, yaar, aapko batana tha mujhe, if this problem was going to happen, you never told me, you never sounded me. And lastly, efforts to educate the masses on working conditions of the doctors. I mean, uh, I was very happy to see that uh, Chetan Bhagat's article. I was also very happy to see some of the eminent other persons, those who have talked about, after that uh, in Broglio, which happened in Calcutta. And it was, you know, great to see all that. So these are, uh, you know, some of the suggestions which were there. Now these are the blank slides I have kept. So I take a pause now. Now I am going to talk something about uh, two, three things if, with your permission. How to build trust. Second, I will talk about how do you behave with your patients. You know, you need to know. You know, what is the behavioral style? And then I will give you that psychometric test, which will be interesting for all of you. And do it very honestly, brutally frank. Be because this paper is going to remain with you. And then we will, by one, we will try to close this. Now, trust, I mean, as uh, 
you know, Isaac Watt has said, learning to trust is one of the life's most difficult tasks. We also know why, what is trust building, why trusting relations are important, and what are the impacts of distrusting. I'm not dwell on that. But what are the, you know, components of building trust, for instance? There are four components of building trust. First is the competence, right? Very, very important for building trust. Second component is dependability. Third component is honesty. And the fourth component is concentrate. So when I say competence, what do I mean? Competence, first thing is, see, even if a person has done DM, but I mean, to say that I know everything under the earth may not be the right way of saying that. So when, as a patient now, think about it. I mean, I'm going to the specialist, but if I'm going to a specialist and the doctor tells me that, look, this is fine, but this is one area I'm not pretty sure about it. Maybe I would like to have a second opinion. Trust me, my trust about that doctor will increase. Rather than you know, sending me to some other person, he is admitting that, look, simple thing is telling that, look, I think this is what it is, but maybe it will be a good idea if I, you know, take a consultation from a specialist. So what you have to say? Chances are the, doc, the patient, you know, will have that trust intact. So that is what, acknowledge what you know and also acknowledge what you do not know. Second is be honest on capability. So when I say, you know, competence, never ever try to project that I am the, you know, I am the wizard, uh, absolutely. It may not happen. I mean, as a patient, I may not like it. So be honest on your capabilities. And uh, thirdly, of course, admit your limitations. So when I am saying on one hand, you need to be competent, right? Because you need to be well versed what's happening in the in, in, in your specialist area. But at the same time, if you are, you know, uh, honest on your capabilities, if you admit your limitations, the trust increases between a doctor and a patient. And of course, uh, these are some of the ways, uh, you know, which talks about how you can keep on increasing the trust. Now, this is one piece which is from Harvard Business Review. Uh, which is applicable for everyone. You know? It's not only specific for doctors, but then uh, I felt that this is very important. I must share with you because I had the excess of uh, Harvard Business School, so there's a the point. Second thing, what they say is you need to be dependable. So somebody said, now the doctor is not approachable. I can tell you, I had my personal experience. I will not name the doctor. The doctor is known to me for the last many, many years in Bangalore. My daughter, younger one, who is in right now in the US, but then when she was with me here, once she had fever for 15 days. First time I went to that doctor, uh, she wrote some, you know, spirogyra or some test, something obscure test which I've never heard. I got it done. And then uh, she said that you show me the reports. I got the reports. I'm trying to ring her, ring her up and she was not there. She had gone on some holidays, vacation. And I felt that, look, uh, at least she, did, she, should, she should have told sure. me that uh, she will not be available. And I was, you know, wondering what to do now, uh, whom to consult. Then I went to some other doctor and then other doctor. Ultimately, it turned out it was a drug-induced fever. So one doctor said, you stop everything and the fever came down, right? Otherwise, you know, she was getting all types of antibiotics, things like that. But dependable. So after that, I can tell you, I have never gone to her. Because I felt very bad. I felt, look, uh, this is not where I am. Mean, especially when you know me. I mean, not that we had not known each other. So when this is the case with me, imagine what will the case with others. So I am saying, dependable, you are absolutely right. Doctor must be approachable. Keeping promises and commitments regarding appointments. So if I have said 9 o'clock, I mean, it's possible 9, 9.50. But 9 o'clock goes to 10.30. I may not like it. And most of the people, at least I can tell you in Bangalore, they are working in schedules. So they don't have that sort of time also. Before committing, ask for clarification. Very important. I mean, you must know what you are committing. And always the third thing is evaluate requests by asking questions. So if I say that, uh, you know, uh, there is some query which I have got. So I need to find out what exactly that person has got in his mind before I give any solutions to that. That's what I'm reflecting. Third is honesty. I mean, nobody will de debate on this. Everybody uh, will agree that, yeah, we need to be honest uh, 
uh, we need to tell the truth also sometimes. Now here, <coughs> I might be having this problem that if I tell the truth, the person might go for the second opinion. I mean, it's better to tell the truth because your trust will remain intact. Because when he goes there, and this doctor also says the same thing, he's going to come back to you, right? That's one. <coughs> Second is, uh, be consistent what you say, so that today I have said something, I need not to change uh, another thing uh, next day. Third is, uh, set realistic expectations. So if I have got as you also will have and you want that as you will see to bring down to 6.5 or 7, and, and in a span of three months, it may not happen. And if you set this type of unrealistic expectations, at the end of three months, I find from 11, it has come to only 10. I feel, uh, you know, disgusted. I said, what is this? I and mean, this is what was promised. So you say that, look, and say we wait reduction and all these things, it will not happen abruptly. It has to be a uh, yeah, gradual thing. So you have to set the realistic expectations. That's how your trust will remain intact. And lastly, which is very, I mean, where I am very particular about it, concentrate. Concentration is nothing but empathy. Do you agree with this? You have to have empathetic attitude. So you need to have listening. Listening is very important in having empathetic attitude. See, when you are having a good listening progress, many times subtle things what a person is going to tell you, you will be able to pick up that. Subtle things. You know, certain symptoms he is telling you will be able to pick up. But if the listening is not very active, you know, there are hundreds of types of listening also. Hearing and listening, there is a hell of a lot of difference. What you hear, hear you, you can hear a lot of noises. Listening is very different. Listening also is active listening and passive listening. I might be looking at my watch, I might be, you know, fiddling my phone and you say, you carry on, tell me the history. That's also hearing. It's not a listening. So, listening is one. Second is interest. You have to show interest in the person. Think about it. I am talking to you and you are looking into your watch. Or I am looking into my drawer. Or I am, you know, I am talking to someone else. Yeah, yeah, can't tell me. Are you giving the right indication that you are showing any interest? So if I realize that my doctor is not having interest in me and my disease, my trust deficit will be there. And lastly, Respect. Respect everybody wants. Everyone, whatever socio-economic strata the person might be coming, he wants respect from them. So, these are some of the points which will be helpful in building trust. Now, this was one uh, BMJ, you know, uh, uh, research which was done, where they found out that the maximum, you know, persons, 140 persons, they were able to speak only for a brief 90 seconds. And this is in UK where the doctors see only 10-15 patients in a day. Think about our situation, you know. So do you think we allow our patients to even tell what they are suffering? Okay, diabetes, this is the blood sugar and my things will start. So we, somehow we are so much time, having time constraint that we are not allowing our patients to listen to the patients. So it's a funny thing, the pain starts in my husband's lower back, then it travels to the, his hip spine, to the neck, then it comes out of his mouth. To the ears and that's why I get these headaches. So these these are the type of uh, you know if, if you are quite attentive, you can pick up those knots. So the, we have had a, a reverse experience. Patient can go on blabbering for uh, so 25 go. minutes and then start from again from <laughs> the first line. <laughs> oh, repeat. That's it. That's it. So this is what I was telling you that uh, listening interest, LIR if you, if you remember that, LIR formula, listening, showing interest and also showing respect. This goes a long way in building your empathetic attitude towards the patient. And listening of course comes almost 50% weightage I would like to give. Almost uh, again 25-25% weightage will be given to interest and respect. Now this is exercise which I wanted to do, I will not do this due to positive time. This also I will skip because uh, these are all talking about what are the benefits of good listening, right? So these are some of the points which are there. Now, uh, there are plenty of benefits to the clini clinicians if we are having uh, an empathetic interactions. And similarly, there are plenty of benefits even to the patients. But what stops us? Now I want to dwell on this. 
know how to communicate better. This boils down, everything boils down ultimately because you are in the business of communication, right? Now, this is a Kalamazoo's consensus statement uh, which talks about essential components of a consultation where he's talking about building the doctor patient relationship, opening the discussion, gathering information, all that. So, this is in a very systematic manner. It says that this is how you have to communicate with the patients. Now, I want to ask you do you know? How do you communicate? These are the four pictures I am showing you. Can somebody tell me what does this reveal? What comes to your mind? This is pertaining to communication. Yeah. What? This first one is a friendly guy who is shaking hands and being friendly. Guy. Closer. Okay. That second one is only mm, uh, announcing. <laughs> you say. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Okay. This fellow is dogmatic. He is telling to respect me, whatever okay. I am saying. Yeah. What is this? Just, uh, this is uh, statistics and trying to show. Absolutely. Absolutely right you are. When it is expected from doctors. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so first thing as you very rightly said sir, it's relational. You know, he is you know, hell bent on developing the relations with the doctors, with the patients. That's first and foremost point. Second is rational. Rational, these are the people, if the report is telling me X, I am going to tell you without any comma full stop. You know, I will not, I will not tell good or bad. This is how it is. Third is very authoritative. Like these are the people. Now, generally, you will find in this present scenario, those who are at the helm of affairs, you know, big big centers, maybe they can afford to do that because as a patient, I know I don't have anyone else to go. But a common doctor, you know, when he resorts to this authoritative attitude. He is do, going to lose the patients. Right? Third, fourth one, what you said is he is a visionary. So he is very really optimistic. He is telling you, okay, fine, your HB1C might be 10, your serum creatinine may be 2.4, you know, your uh, you know, LDL could be 200, but still I have seen a lot of patients, they, they continue for another 10 years without any major problem. So he is only showing the positive side he, to the patient. So, these are the visionary type of doctors. Yeah. Examples, authority, I, I've seen like if you adhere to this treatment, you come to me. Otherwise, there are plenty of other doctors. Have you seen? You know, I have seen a lot of doctors, they behave like that. If you adhere, what I'm telling you, then fine, otherwise, please don't come to me. Now, how many people can do that? Maybe as I said. Those who are at the echelon of their, you know, uh, in their specialty, they can do that. Because I know that after that, there is no one to go. But normal persons cannot do that. So, this is, uh, these are the four types, basically. Yeah. So, now, this is something which I was talking about. Do you all agree with this? Birds are similar for the flock together. Now, you know, when they are talking about behavioral style, I will give you very nice uh, you know, example, it always happens with all of us. If I meet for the first time a person whom I have never met, with whom I have never talked, two things happen. I immediately I can relate it with this person, I can get along with this person or not. Why does this happen? It happens because we always you know, evaluate the qualities what this person might be having with my, my qualities. Right? And that is how either I feel I can relate with them or I feel I cannot relate with them. Right? So, if that is the case, if this is true, then another thing which becomes very important is, do we know what is my behavior? So, and this is what I just now explained to you. And we are more likely to trust people who behave like what we do. Right? Now, people who are flexible, who are able to adjust their styles, will be able to have a better rapport with the persons I mean, as a patient also. Now, these are different uh, you know, advantages of various behavioral style, right? And then you can close the interpersonal gaps if you are able to flex your style. Now, you are all interested to know your style, yes. right? So, what I will do, I will give you a sheet. You have to be brutally honest. 
So there are characteristics given and I will explain to you how you have to actually what you have to do. You don't have to think about it. You do not have to think about it too much. You don't have to be rational that uh, this is good or that is good. Whatever you feel is right, which is applicable to you, you have to do that. And this paper is going to remain with you. I am not going to do anything. This is a psychometric test, sir. So. <laughs> So what you have to do is, you will notice here, there are four uh, characteristics given. So technical, action oriented, good listener and creative. Now you have to give four marks, four, to the quality which you feel is most appropriate to you. And then in a gradual manner, three, two, one. So let me explain. So if I find myself that I am a very technical person, so I will give four myself. Then I will say I am a you know, good listener, I will give three to myself. I say I am creative, two. And action oriented, I feel I am least, so I will give one. Like this, you do it, I will only give you five minutes so that you don't try to debate too much on you, in your mind. So, no, these are four columns. Technical, action oriented, good listener, creative. First line if you see. Likewise, you have to put it in all the lines. Now, if I find that I am highly technical, I will give four. It is on zero to four scale. Three is less than further less. Least is one. So if I have given my example, I am highly technical, so I give four. I say I am a good listener, I give three. I say I am creative, I give two. I give action oriented one. What is the number one to eight? You forget about that okay. right now. I will tell you what to do. Okay. You do till here and then here. Okay. In five minutes. Any word? All, 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 all columns. All. Huh. Sorry. So all columns all. you don't have to do. Only horizontal you have to rate. Am I not able to communicate? You have to rate only horizontal. Technical, action oriented, good listener and So, 1, 2, 3, 4 across the row. 1, 2, 3, 4 across the row. Not this huh. It will not be 1, 2, 3, 4. It will be 3, 2, 1 like that. Whatever quality you feel is most appropriate, you have to give 4. Across the row. Across the row. Okay. All rows. No? All rows. All columns. Not huh, all columns. 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 All like this one. Even for independent, friendly and also those also, one, two, three. Yes, yes. Same thing. Cool. Okay. Like this. This I will tell you what to do later. Okay. Just five minutes, huh? In this column, top left side, whatever marks you have calculate like this, from top to this here, second, whatever numbers have come, you write here. Where? Here, here. This is 2, this is 1. This, this is, is 2 one. plus 5. So 2 and 5. In these two rows, whatever numbers have come, the right here first. Two. Total. Total. Two so suppose 3 plus 2 plus 4, like that, whatever number comes here, hmm. you write here. Right. Say 14 has come, so write 14 plus. And whatever numbers are coming here in five row number 5, five. right here. Okay. Two, and five. 2 plus 5. So next is, before I actually reveal, I must tell you the genesis, how it is worked out. There are two scales, you know. One is assertiveness scale. So you will find there are some people they are very assertive. And there are some people they are not so assertive. Right? Similarly, there are some people they are highly task oriented. There are some people those who are people oriented. Do you understand what I, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Task orientation? Yes. People orientation are those people who will consider the you know people side, the yeah. comfort level, yeah. all that as a first priority rather than task. Right? Task oriented people say that look, this has to be done, has to be done. Irrespective of how much difficulty it's going to put on you. So these are the two scales, assertive scale as well as task orientation and people orientation. And of course, flexibility. Now, you would 
have total data, these numbers, 2 plus 5, whatever comes, have a total data. Yeah. Right? So, the, the maximum score, what you have acquired in any quadrant, is your major behavioral style. And the second highest score is yours. And the, see, there are two main behavioral styles which we exhibit. Not that, there are four behavioral styles. There are autocrats, there are persuaders, there are analyzers, there are socializers. Now, not that we are only having one or two styles. We, we, we exhibit all the four styles in different situations. But predominantly, there will be two styles which will be exhibiting. So, if, for instance, I can tell you, my score will be more here. Here. And surprisingly, which is very rare, my second highest score is here. Which is very, very rare. So that means generally I am very persuader. I will try to persuade people on to do things. But sometimes, my second behavioral style is that I am also a very analyzer. I will analyze the situation and then accordingly. So, who has got the maximum score? Would somebody like to reveal? This is absolutely, yeah. So, where is the maximum score? This uh, socializer. Socializer. So, I will tell you what type of qualities you have. Right? So, when you find a socializer coming to you, you feel extremely happy. So, if I go and talk to you, if I go and talk to you, you would love that I talk something about you, about something in general, before I straightway come onto the brass task. Okay, who is an uh, autocrat here? Anyone? Autocrat? The second score. Oh, sorry? The second highest score. Second, no, first highest score. Anybody is autocrat here? No harm in telling. Right. Second almost. Ha, second, fine. Uh, who has got highest score here? Persuader. So, you three are, you know, very high on assertiveness and very high on task. Are you getting my point? You are very assertive. You know, your expressions are very assertive. I can tell you, it's absolutely true. I mean, the way you have been expressing yourself. I want to make my point, I will make my point very loud and clear. Right? But at the same time, I am not authoritative. I am not forcing upon you. I will try to persuade you. You know? Until the time I get the mind from you, I will be explaining that. I will be telling you the merits of that. So that is the basic behavioral style what you exhibit. The second highest score also tell you the slightly less dominant behavior. Right? So if suppose you are a persuader here. Right? Am I right? Which is your second highest score? Autocrat. You are also very rare like me. Right? You are also autocrat? Mine is a first so, is a socializer. Yeah. The second is a analyzer. Ah, so yeah. this is very common. Yeah, this, is common. <laughs> this is very common. When I tell you the characteristics of these people, you will find it gels very well. Okay, anyone from this side? I'm a socializer, I'm a persuader. Socializer, persuader also fine. Right? Socializer and autocrat. Very yeah. so maybe you are socializer outside, <laughs> inside in the house you become autocrat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, sorry. <laughs> so it happens. But this is also, see, these diagonally opposite hmm. characteristics are difficult to get. Like I am telling you, mind this thing, persuader analyzer. When I did this exercise 15 years back, I was surprised. I said, ah, this is, this is how I am. But then I realized that, yeah, perhaps I behave like that. When I try my level best and things don't happen, then I start thinking, yeah, what's the reason? Why is it so? What, how can I address this? Anyone else? What sir, yours? Socializer, persuader. Socializer, persuader goes very well. So now I will share with you some of the qualities. Now let me tell you that uh, this is one session which I do it for three to four hours, you know, uh, on behavioral style. So we don't have the luxury of time. So I have just cut out a little bit about characteristics so that you can get a flavor of that, right? So these are some of the uh, four quadrants what we have been talking about. Now if you talk about persuaders, you know, these are generally you will find open, warm, friendly people. Right? Open, warm, friendly people. However, as I have said, they are highly assertive. This is low assertion, this is high assertion. 
and this is low task, this is high task. They are friendly, but they are highly task oriented also. It doesn't mean that they will say, okay, fine, you don't do the task. But also they are very friendly in behavior. They are people oriented, informal, attentive, right? They are direct, candid. They are very frank in expressing themselves. Fluent, clear communicator. Do you agree with this? You know, you have seen these people, they are very fluent communicators, right? Inspirational, they are entertainer speakers. Assertive, action oriented, tenacious, till the time, you know, the thing is done, they will keep on trying, trying, trying. Fast pace, broad stroke, they will generally walk fast. You know, they will not be walking slowly. If you see their body language, they will be walking briskly, you know, with some purpose. I and mean, that is how the movements are. They are generally very enthusiastic, they are witty, they have got good sense of humor, right? They have got low threshold for boredom. If there is something which they are doing, where the boredom is going to set in, they will move away. They will not be adhering to that. They sets a vision and leads others also to the future. Generally, you will find those big, big leaders, you know, visionary leaders, will be having this quality of a persuader. Now, also I must tell you, there is nothing like one quality is good, one quality is bad, nothing like that. There are different situations when you need different qualities. So, when the things are not happening, you need an autocrat. Right? You need a taskmaster. You need a person who can take decisive actions and get it done. So that's what I'm trying to imply that all the qualities are good qualities, they are required. Like socializers, they are very much required. Socializers are required for the teamwork. You know, if you want to have a teamwork, you need socializers. So if I have to form a team, if I bring in one persuader, one socializer, one analyzer, it's going to work in a very nice manner. So, these are persuaders. Now, let's move for the socializers. Now, these are the people, for them, relationship matters. They are relationship-oriented people, right? Till the time somebody breaches the trust. So, they believe, they behave, they believe on others, but if suppose somebody does, you know, breach the trust, then, you know, they just move away from such people. That's one basic characteristic. Getting along is a high priority for them. They are generally quiet, they are cooperative, they are supportive people. They are easy to get to know and work with, minimizes conflict. They give advice and counsel. They are also there, help others, and they are a great listener generally. Their listening promise is pretty good, right? They provide positive strokes for others' work and accomplishments. So if you're working in a team, these are the people, they will appreciate the good work of the other people also. They will not be competitive in a spirit. They are, however, not a risk taker. They want to tread the, you know, safe path. They prefer safety and comfort. For them, that is calming in stressful situations. So these are the people, they are very calming in and they are excellent in building teams and coalitions. Now, who are the socializers here? Do you think you have got yeah. those qualities? It matches with your uh, basically behavior, right? Almost. Good. Analyzers. There is an analyzer here. Right. Second highest. Second highest. Okay. Anybody is first highest analyzer? No. Okay. They are technically oriented. Generally, they, they are tech savvy, technically oriented, not tech savvy, technically oriented. They are very thorough, but very conservative. They seek structure. Now, for them, there has to be a proper structure. You know, they will plan everything meticulously. Then they will work their plan. They are very quiet, unassuming, practical. They show little emotions. You know, some people are extremely emotional. You know, they will show their emotions, they will come and pat on your back. Persuaders will generally come and, hi, how are you, and you know, something like that. These are the people, they are very quiet. They will not show their emotions. They are also the people who are data driven. You know, you had seen in the behavioral style, you know. These are the people, they are data driven. So if I have to go and talk to an analyzer, I will give us some evidences. Then only I am going to persuade him. Otherwise, I cannot get the mind from that person. He will show so many the data because they will try to analyze the data. These are also the people one should never try to press for decisions because they are, don't try to take decisions fast. They take their own time in taking decisions. They will evaluate the pros and cons, then only they will take the decisions. So this is how the analyzers, they function, right? And their, of course, interest is solving the problems as a problem. Now comes the autocrats. Now, as I said, every behavioral style is a good style. Autocrats are also very much needed when things are not happening.
these are the very dominant forceful strong wind why because here if you see they are highly task oriented right they are highly task oriented people orientation is very poor so for them it doesn't matter how do you feel about it my job has to be done so if if you are an autocrat and you have got a you know uh, center and you say that come come what may 9 o'clock you have to be here and since the patients are here till 10:30 even if you are a female i don't mind but you have to leave only at 10:30 not bothering i mean how you are going to reach all that so that is how their behavior is doesn't show personal feelings or emotions they are also you know like analyzers they keep their emotions intact controls and motivates self because generally don't people don't you know appreciate such kind of people I mean, a person who is a task master. Do you think anybody is going to appreciate such persons? So they have to self-motivate themselves. They are hardworking, result-oriented. They are direct and to the point. They are very methodical. They also like to decide and act fast. Like a challenge, and they challenges new ideas. Uh, they makes concrete, tangible things happen. They take responsibility and relieves others of it. Takes risks to get the immediate results. So these are some of the you know facets of it. autocrat now why am i showing you all this so you know your basic behavioral style now if i know that my basic behavioral style is that i am a persuader no i have just switched off okay i am a persuader and i am meeting a analyzer these are two diagonally opposite people analyzer will be very soft calm and i am a very persuader Now what happens is if I am meeting an analyzer and I realize that from and from the body language there are you know many other ways also of figuring out body language all that and if I find that he is an analyzer and if I am you know forcing myself too much I am too aggressive assertive the person will further go in the shell so he will never be able to even explain also what does he want so you need to step back you know your assertiveness scale you need to break it down then only the other person will be able to. Express and vice versa. If I am an analyzer and I am behaving with a persuader, my patient is a persuader. I am an analyzer. If I want to build a better connect with him, maybe I need to show some more emotions, some more life when I am talking to that person. So once we flex these styles, you know we will be in a better position to have a better connect. So that is why I showed with you, and that will actually result in better relationship with these patients. Make sense, right? Does this make sense? Do you think it's helpful? Yes. How about you? Huh? So do this; it will be extremely helpful. Then there are some rapport building activities. First thing, what I always say is, if you have got a system by which you know the name, first name of that patient, and you call that person, come, Mr. So and So, you know, it immediately you build a rapport with that person. And you know, humanly, it's not possible for you to remember. But suppose the file comes to you beforehand, and you see that the person who is going to come is Manoj, and then that person taps the door, and you say, "Come, Manoj, inside." Manoj is completely at ease. He is, you know, and you, if you smile, you know, it is even much better. That you know, immediately if the doctor has recognized me, and he will be in a better frame of mind. Now, I will skip all that. Uh, this also i felt that it is very important how to convey the bad news uh, as a clinician uh, it is very very important uh, first thing i would like to only say is that we have to prepare you know ourselves what are the things we need to tell what are the things we need not to tell we should also decide who should be accompanying the patient right who is the right person to tell this information and uh, you know uh, we have to also give the information with honesty sensitivity has to be there you know when you are telling something you know like type 1 diabetes when you are telling to someone uh, do not take all hope away I mean, have some something for him or her to cheer it up uh, when we are conveying this so that you know he is he or she is little bit optimistic how so bad the situation may be as it happens in cancer for instance i mean knowing fully well that the person is going to die but still we keep on giving some hope and you know all that is there uh rest of the things are uh, don't impose the truth but if the patient asks then you know we don't have to lie also we have to tell the truth we have to also give avoid false assurances uh, you know all that uh, and in the end 
We have to show empathy, but we don't have to lose control. And one thing is that there could be emotional outburst from the patients also when you are telling us. So we should be, I mean, uh, we should be aware about it. It could be some emotional outburst. So with this, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank each one of you uh, for being present here. Why I am saying so, you had the option of so many, you know, sessions, uh, parallel sessions which are going on. And uh, for coming for this innocuous session, I would say, I am uh, really grateful to you. And which has made my day, uh, interacting with all of you. And my only request, which I always uh, say, I mean, if you decide at least two things in the session which you are going to implement, uh, you know, you will be, I would say, getting something out of it. What the time, what you have devoted, two hours here. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.